Hi, I'm Brian Cantrell, VP of Engineering. Our architecture is that we've got a, a head node per pod, uh, and for those who've been around Join for a while, you know a pod is a, a group of machines that are, are co-located, that are in the uh, one latency domain, um, and usually one physical building, one, one data center. Um, so these guys are installing a head node now. Um, and um, so, Josh, did you, did you want to talk about the, the, the change in install architecture in SDC 6? No. Okay, well, so that, that, that's an important thing to talk about. Um, and I think maybe it's worth uh, a little bit of a history lesson in terms of how we did this before. In SDC 5 and before, um, how we installed the operating system. So the, the way that this has been done for us and for many folks historically in, in clouds is that the operating system is installed on a compute node. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. Um, and it's installed on, you've got some number of root devices there. Uh, and you install the operating system on those disks, and you boot up off those disks, um, and that, that's, what the, that's what these compute nodes run. And it seems, like, seems totally reasonable, but it's actually completely unreasonable, and it's got tons and tons of problems. Um, so I, I just don't know if you want to expand on what some of those problems were cause in, in terms of why, um, why we needed to find a different path. One of the problems is obviously that it takes a long time to do that install process. Uh, and when you're done with that process, you have a system that has persistent state everywhere on the system. So if you make a change on that system, that change might not be monitored anywhere and that system might be quite a bit different from another system that is doing the exact same thing. Um, and that's a that's a big problem for obviously managing a lot of machines. If you have machines that are totally different, um, have different configurations for um, size of swap device or anything like that, uh, those can all make differences in machines that you don't notice right away. Um, there's also the case where you're using two of the disks typically um, for the OS and uh, which are unavailable for creating zones for customers. So that's space that we're, we're not able to sell. Which um, can be significant, right? I mean, yes. you, you're dealing with two spindles out of, you know, six or yeah. eight or maybe 10 or 12, but that's still, I mean, it, yeah. it, even in the best case, that's 20% yeah. of your storage is gone. Yeah, and then when you want to do an upgrade, the upgrade process is updating all the files on the disk and hoping that it worked. And if it didn't, you have to try to roll it back on disk and you don't know for sure that the state you rolled back to is exactly the same as the state that you had before. And, um, and you know, even if you use ZFS snapshots and you, you put together an infrastructure on top of ZFS snapshots to be able to roll back that way, you still run into issues where you don't roll back properly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's, there's a lot of, of challenging stuff there and it doesn't change the fact that these things are destructive effectively when you're doing this upgrade. Um, right, so you, you mentioned how long it took to install these things to jump these servers. And people might think, well, I'm only going to do that when I initially install a machine. Well, no. When, when we push an upgrade to the operating system, you, you, you need to go do that again. And it, it just, the, the problems end up multiplying on themselves. I mean, how do we get out of this? I mean, you have to have root buses, right? Well, <laughs> you have to have a root file system. Uh, in, normally, when you boot, uh, even, with, even if you do have a root device, the first thing that gets loaded is what's called a boot archive, which gets loaded into memory and has initial modules and everything you need to mount the actual root device. Um, so instead of having that RAM file system uh, exist and just to load the root device, we basically made that the root device. So we put all of the root file system into that boot archive. So, uh, so the, the root file system lives in memory. What heresy? How is this? <laughs> this is not possible. It cannot be done, I say. It is absolutely impossible. Um, and indeed, that, that is, that's the reaction we've actually gotten from some folks. It's like, well, you actually can't do that. It's like, well, actually, we have done that. So, um, the, and people have that reaction because I think in the enterprise space, we used to call this booting discless. Yeah. Um, and uh, way back in the day, this, was, this got some kind of traction in the enterprise space. But basically, this has been in the HPC space where people have done this, right? Um, so um, we are we're bringing this uh, this really important uh, architectural change 
to a new domain. So let's go talk about the different problems we had. So install, what happens for install? So I don't write to the root, de root devices. How do I install a new operating system on the on the node? On on the non non head. I love non head. For, so for the non head nodes, they all network boot. But instead of having the live image piece be just an installer for writing to disk, it's now the whole system. So I know, but wait a minute. So I'm downloading the entire image of the operating system every time. I mean, that must take hours to download. Uh, nope. Oh, really? <laughs> How long does it take? Uh, about 30 seconds. Okay, all right. Okay, well, all right. So we can just take that objection and throw that one out. Uh, okay, but this still doesn't feel right to me. This still, I, this just can't be right. Like, no root devices just feel so wrong to me. Uh, there have got to be other problems with this. All right, so the, well, wait a minute. How do I upgrade that? Uh, reboot on a new image. Oh, okay. Well, how do I roll back? Reboot on the old image. Oh, you have an answer for everything. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, and I'm able then to, um, and I can arbitrarily roll back, right? I mean, I can roll back if something works for me. In fact, one of the things you talked about is doing this automatically, right? Yeah. So how, how might that work? Can they... Well, we, we know which version of, of the image you last booted successfully because when the image boots, it sends a message to the MAPI, the API, uh, saying that it's up and with this specific image and it sends some other system information along with that so that we know that what the, what's in the server at all times. Um, and that information also includes which version of the live image we're running. So if you reboot on a new live image that you've just downloaded and for some reason it's corrupt or it doesn't boot, we'll see in the interface that that image never actually came up on that system. So we can just reboot it back into the old image using the API. Wow, so you get an auto rollback for, yeah, that's, that's terrific. So wait a minute, how does patching work then? Like they, in my old world, I would just SSH onto a bunch of these machines and start hacking away. Yeah. You just reboot them. Oh. <laughs> so you're saying it's actually more organized now to do, to do patching, it can be done Deliberately, you can have a centralized location. Yeah, and you're also guaranteed that the configuration is the same on all the servers. Curse you and your good answers. Okay, I got, I got one. I got one. The the DRAM consumption of this. I mean, I'm obviously lighting up now way more of my DRAM. I'm burning my DRAM yeah. for this, you know, the, this fancy in-memory image that you've got. So how how does that gonna work? Well, right now it's using up about 256 megabytes you, uh, of RAM. Now that was a lot of RAM at some point. <laughs> Darn it! Um, well, I, I foiled again by your good answers. Um, the uh, oh well, well, wait a minute. How about the reliability? Aren't I sacrificing some reliability by not having root devices? By not having disks. That's right. I listen. I, it's hard for me to even make this argument with a straight face. Okay, just just indulge me. Um, only only if you assume that your disks are more reliable than your RAM. But, oh, wait a minute. Now, so, just so people understand, so we're not using the disks at all on these nodes? All the disks are used for zones. Oh, so I'm actually using even more of the disks for zones. Yes. So, if I'm, if I'm doing stuff that's very performance sensitive, um, that is using the disks, which is a bit of an oxymoron, I actually get more of the disks, not fewer of the disks. Okay. Now I will raise the one true objection. <laughs> Uh, and this is the, the something that we thought you thought very deliberately about. If I have a failure mode that encompasses my entire data center, I lose a PDU, my entire rack goes down, including my head node, and my head node does not come back up. Um, my compute nodes will also not be able to. So, I mean, how do we mitigate that? How do we deal with that particular issue? There are a lot of options for how we can can handle that because the the boot archive and kernel are really all you need to actually boot the machine. There's all kinds of possibilities for how how we actually get that kernel and boot archive on the system. There's I mean we could boot them from the take a USB key and boot the nodes if we wanted to. It just just has yeah, the default kernel kind of, yeah, on right, it. Right. Uh, or we could even put that in on somewhere on the disk. So but, and, and what's the likelihood of this failure? In terms of the, because um, I think when we thought about this, like, okay, so this is this is a potential failure, but you are, um, you're dealing with such an unlikely failure mode, and one that we thought was mitigatable uh, in a lot of different yeah. ways. Well, a, a, another solution that we have that, that is going to eventually be in there is the high availability of the head nodes. When we have multiple head nodes, um, either one of them will be able to do DHCP to boot the nodes because 
there really isn't anything to that process other than responding to the HCP and sending them out to FTP. And, and just to be clear, the only failure mode we're talking about is a failure mode that encompasses failure of both the nodes and the head node. If the head node just blows up, yeah. the nodes that are currently up yeah, running they, they're are, not affected are, they, they are not affected. They will only be affected when they attempt to go reboot. If the whole thing turns off at the same time, and you turn everything on, and the head node doesn't come up. Right, so you need failure on all nodes. You need a cascading failure. You, you need a, first of all, massive failure that involves all of your nodes. You would need a failure on the, uh, and it comes to the head node as well. And then that, that head node needs to have a fatal failure. You need to basically talk like a lightning strike or something in a, uh, in a poorly run data center. So, um, and um, we, we feel we've got a lot of ways to go mitigate that. We feel it's an unlikely failure mode. Um, if we if we weigh that failure mode versus all of the very well known failure modes of the the excellent way of doing things for us this was no comparison but this, this is a, a a much 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 better architecture um, and I think that we, and we we've started to see that I think bear out I and mean, I think it's it's been uh, it's been great to be able to go um, and we we really focus on booting these things quickly on uh, things like compressing the image um, we may want to talk about the, the compression a little bit that that uh, Jerry worked on I think that was pretty interesting stuff yeah so. Previously, we had all of the files for the whole root file system, including slash USR, which is pretty large, and everything on the live image. So that was all of running in memory uncompressed. So we had the boot archive, which was compressed itself. The bootloader decompressed it into memory, and then it ran. It was about 800 megabytes of RAM that it was using. Um, so the work Jerry did was to take the slash USR partition and turn it into a lo-fi mount so that we could mount it compressed. So in the actual boot archive that gets loaded into memory, um, that one is now about 256 megs um, and it contains a file that contains the slash USR partition. That file gets mounted as slash USR, uh, but it stays compressed, so it's mounted as a compressed file system. Uh, because of that, it's read-only, but that doesn't actually cause any problems for the stuff that we're doing. That's great. Very cool stuff. And so, we, and we've seen already uh, machines booting faster. Yeah, because well. now they only have to down. Now they first of all, they don't have to decompress the boot archive itself. The the kernel actually handles transparently compressing, uh, well, transparently decompressing stuff in slash USR that you need. Um, and so the boot archive itself is on uncompressed and just loaded straight into memory uh, as is, and that way there's no decompression phase. That's right. So the, the actual end of cost of DRAM is being less, that we, we boot faster, and those kinds of problems um, are, are problems that are packable, right? We just, we're, so where there are um, issues with, with this kind of model, we found it to be um, mitigatable, sur uh, sur surmountable, um, in contrast to the issues with the old model, which were really um, uh, pretty endemic. Uh, and there was very little we could do. Yeah. So, great. All right, well, it sounds like a, it sounds like a great new architecture.